Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Jesus said, the first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sin against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. The first reading is a reading from the book of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I have formed for myself so that they may declare my praise. This is the word of the Lord.
from Paul's letter to the Philippians. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. So in my travels, I have come to the realization that there is a museum for everything. And I really mean there is a museum for everything. There is the Mustard Museum in Middleton, although when I saw it, it was still located in Mount Horeb. There is, in the Dells, of course, a museum of root beer, and one of the strangest museums I've been to is in Mexico, in Guanajuato, where there is a museum of mummies, people who are accidentally mummified by soil conditions, and then when their families could no longer pay to have them buried, were dug up and put in a museum because a cemetery ran out of room. But one of those unusual museums that I have been to, and the one that really sticks with me the most, is the National Museum of Funeral History on the north side of Houston, Texas. And despite its morbid subject area, it really is an interesting place because it features things like these really wild, over-the-top Ghanaian coffins. It has the embalming machine that was used on President Harry Truman. It has a couple of old hearses. And then it also has a crystal and lead coffin that weighed about a ton. So fortunately, I would, was not a pallbearer for that funeral. I can't even imagine what they would have done. But what the museum showed most of all was how our relationship to death and how we deal with the dead has changed over time. And really what it showed is that that relationship has not changed, or that it has changed a lot over a not a very long period of time. At a funeral that I did last year in Portage, I was talking with the funeral director about how things have changed even during his career of about 30 years. There are still the traditional funerals like we have in church, but more often what he is seeing are families holding celebrations of life at bars or restaurants or at other places where the body of the deceased is almost never present. These are celebrations that are held because someone has indeed died, yet there's somewhat of a reluctance to acknowledge the fact that everybody is gathered together there because somebody who was important to them has died. Now, death used to be a much more of a matter-of-fact part of life, and when I was working at the VA in Milwaukee, I discovered that the original Commandant's house that was built in 1867 actually has a coffin niche in the main stairwell, this cutout where the stairwell makes a turn so that a coffin that is being carried from upstairs could actually make the corner on the staircase. And then I've also heard family stories um, about how at um, funerals, either in Milwaukee or in San Francisco, that often that front room, the parlor of these old houses, was like the funeral home. It was where the visitation was held before the church service. And in the past, it was often the family that prepared the body of the dead person for burial, as is still done in some parts of the world. So this kind of intimate experience of being around the body of another person, someone that you loved, is something that much of our contemporary culture has tried to push away or to hide. But it wasn't so in Jesus' time. And death is a central part of today's gospel reading, maybe even the central part. There is a part of the reading where Judas is focused on the money and the extravagant expense of the perfume, 
and where the part where Jesus says that the poor will always be with you. But at that time and place, that was true because pretty much everyone was poor, including Jesus and the disciples. And it was just expected that poor people and people who were even poorer than you would be everywhere and you would encounter them at any time you set foot outside of the house. But Jesus, however, will not always be there. So if we want to use more of a modern day metaphor, at least for me, this reading brings something to mind that's more like hospice. That Jesus knows he is going to die, even if the disciples don't know that or if they refuse to acknowledge that. But Mary does know. And the scene of her anointing Jesus' feet is like the process of cleaning and anointing a body for burial. And one interesting note to me is that this is happening at Lazarus' house. Because just before this, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And now Jesus himself is preparing to die and to be raised. But really, the line that catches my attention most in this reading is at the very end, where Jesus tells the disciples that they will not always have him with them. And if Lent is a time where we're supposed to be contemplating Jesus' death, then it's also a time for us to contemplate our own, or at least the impermanence of things in this world. And it does force us to focus on things that really matter to us and focus on those people who really matter to us. Because one question that this raises for me when I think about it is what things do we hold dear that are worth sacrificing for now? And who are the people who are really important to us and who are worth spending time with right now? Sometimes it seems like we like to think that we have all of the time in the world and that we can always return to people and to places and things at a time that is convenient to us and that we are in control of our schedules at all times and in all places. But if there is one thing that the pandemic over the last two years has shown us, it is that we are not as in control of our lives as we like to think. And markers of life events over the past two years, but really, especially during 2020, things like graduations and weddings and even funerals, these things that used to be normal and everyday occurrences, and maybe sometimes even things that we would consider to be minor annoyances that would impinge on our time, just didn't happen, and they could not happen. We no longer had them with us, and suddenly we saw them for the important events that they were, and the people that they were intended to celebrate as those important people in our lives. So Judas's comments aside, there is in today's gospel a sense of impending sadness. And the liturgies of Holy Week that begin next week have to me a very mournful tone. Because someone we love is not going to be with us, and that loss is sudden and to the disciples very acute. And I imagine they found themselves wishing that they had had more time to spend with Jesus, as we may also wish for ourselves when we lose someone who is important to us. But there is also a note of hope in this gospel passage because the setting of the reading is at Lazarus' house, and it is a reminder that death does not have the final word. And that is something for us to carry with us, not just through the end of Lent and into the Easter season, but also every day as we go out and about with our workday lives. Amen. Please stand. And let us profess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and became made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. 
We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people today will be form three, found on page 387. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We pray especially for Michael, our presiding bishop, Matt, our bishop, and Father Mike, our rector. We pray for our parish families, especially Mike, Brenda, Austin and Tyler, Helen, Domingo, Mary Jo, Laura, and Nick and Kathy. We pray for those celebrating birthdays, especially Katie, Tim, Lori, Carol, Julia, and those celebrating anniversaries, especially Roger and Charlotte. We pray for Joe, our president, Tony, our governor, and Mitch, our mayor. And we pray especially for those seeking healing and comfort, especially Anne, Anne, Burley, Dan and Donna, Dick, Ed, Grace, Joe, Julie, Julie, Kathy, Lynn, Nathaniel, Pat, Pat, Pete, Sam, Sue, and Steve. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for St. Simeon's Lafayette. And in the Eau Claire cycle of prayer, we pray for the Church of Nigeria of the Anglican Communion. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please be seated. Just a reminder that next week between the services, we will do the Stations of the Cross here in the sanctuary with the children and families. Everybody is welcome to join us. So if you would like to, next Sunday at 930, in between the two services, we'll do Stations of the Cross. Thank you. Just a couple of more announcements. So this Wednesday is the last of our um, Wednesday Eucharist at 6, excuse me, 5.30, um, followed by soup and, and salad. So if you're interested in joining us, we will be, um, actually, we usually we are over here in the, the St. George Chapel for that particular service, but it's at 5.30.
Also, um, if, you're, if you're any visitors or guests, just a reminder that in the Episcopal Church, all baptized people are welcome at Holy Communion. And finally, thank you to everybody who assisted with Kermit Newcomer's funeral yesterday. Um, it went well, and I think the, the people who are here um, were very pleased with the send-off that the parish gave to him. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who was tempted in every way as we are yet did not sin. By his grace, we are able to triumph over every evil and to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for him who died for us and rose again. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. 
And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself, in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.